So it's my pleasure to, to introduce uh, Professor Harry Sweeney, who you heard yesterday. Uh, today, you'll hear him again, and he will give some words of wisdom about how to write a paper. And uh, Harry has written some of the clearest and most interesting papers that I've ever read. So although I've heard uh, him talk about this um, a few times, um, I, I'm, I'm going to be glued to, to what he has to tell us uh, today as well. Okay. Okay. So we're all involved in writing, and it's worth thinking uh, about how to communicate effectively. And want to make some suggestions in the next few minutes. Now, this is different from proving theorems. This is one person's perspective on writing. There is no rule book, and there are no proofs of what works and what doesn't. Uh, but we all know that there are some papers and some talks which are better presented, more um, readily accessible than others. And so I want to discuss some of the considerations making your work more accessible to a larger audience. So here are some typical numbers. They're just, there are no exact numbers. It's hard to get figures. But in some journals, they publish information on the number of people who hit on the title of a paper or download the abstract or download the, the full manuscript as a PDF. So you have some idea of numbers. In the five years after an article is published, the numbers are something like this. They, the precise numbers should be taken with a grain of salt, but just to give an idea of the response to a paper you write, and it appears in the literature that we write, you have in it certain key words. People are doing searches using Google Scholar, ISI, Web of Science, the Archive, and various other search engines looking for particular terms that relate to their own interests. And maybe 10,000 perusers of the web will find, a, using their keyword search, your article will pop up. That's not untypical. That's a huge number. When you see that, you think, wow, a lot of people are going to read my article. Well, they read the title, and then a few go ahead and read the abstract. <laughs> right? The title has some words in it that they're not familiar with, the reader is not familiar with. <coughs> jargon or some arcane terms, but they go to the abs. Some find it interesting and proceed. And they read the abstract. They read the first sentence. And they have in their keyword search, using Google Scholar or some other search engine, they have turned up a list of 600 articles. So. Do they really want to read this paper? They start to read the abstract, and then out of these 1,000 readers, maybe one-tenth will go ahead to look at the paper online, to just go beyond the abstract and to begin to look at the paper. Of those who look at the paper, 
maybe, ultimately, if you're lucky, 10 people will cite the paper. So you see there's a considerable fall off in numbers here from those who first see the title of your paper or some keywords that are listed in your paper that match their own interest. And of this 10,000, one may be, be, one may be fortunate enough to have five years later, 10 people have cited your paper. Okay. So we want to think about ways of increasing this number 10. And having a larger audience appreciate what great work you have done. Right? So let's think about the title. The title, just common sense to say it should describe what you've done. You want to have some key words in it that others interested in the topic would recognize and want to look further. In writing a paper, writing a title, in writing an abstract, in writing the full paper, you want to write for the broadest audience possible. I don't mean water it down and uh, write it in the way it would be presented on Fox News. I mean, write for a scientific audience, but using the if possible, no jargon, minimal amount of jargon, and words that would mean something to a broader audience. Of course, broad has different meaning if your audience is going to be nature, which really is very broad, or uh, the physical review section B, which is condensed matter physics, or a specialty journal that's in, say, the area of general relativity, in some terms, would be common to that audience, not more broadly commonly known in the scientific audience. Now, you see titles sometimes, especially in specialty journals, that go on 25 words including some long chemical names and various terms that are unfamiliar. Try to be brief. Try to be brief and to the point. And as I said already, and we'll say many times, avoid jar jargon and acronyms. If you're in any field you're in, we'll have uh, acronyms that are very commonly used. We use PIV in our experiment. What the heck is PIV? You know, particle image loss, the loss symmetry. Well, if you do experiments with PIV, it's part of your everyday vocabulary. If you work on quantum field theory, it is not. All right. So if possible, avoid acronyms. There are a few acronyms common enough that you might use. NASA, N-A-S-A, -S -S it's OK. You don't have to write out the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, but not many, not many such. So now you have the paper. You have downloaded the paper, and you're going to read it. And I want to consider the order in which people read things. And I want, uh, would like to have seven volunteers from the faculty, say some of the people in the back and front, to write the order in which they read things. Here, let me pass, well, let's, if you pass out that side, and you could pass out this side. So this is a sheet in which you fill out for yourself the order in which you read things, and like uh, 12 participants to fill this out. And by filling it out, I mean there is a number one. One is the first thing we read, two is the second, and three, and so forth. And then you have different sections of a paper that are listed to the right. And you can put yours right up there on the board. Let's get some volunteers. Please to come. Would you go up and put sure. your list on the board, please? You come up. 
Need more volunteers just to get an idea. Okay. Yes, please, please come. Let's fill. Let's get twelve participants. Would you please? Okay. All right. How about you? You go up. Yes. Does everyone have a sheet? If you're not up there, you can fill out the sheet. Uh, would you like to yeah, yeah. list the order of, in which you read a paper? No, uh, uh, on the well, blackboard up there. Just pick one of those so columns and complete it on the right side. Pick a column. Okay. So participants, sir, uh, you want to come on this side? I just want to see if there's a difference in participants and the faculty. We need some more faculty. Where are the faculty? <laughs> Bala. <laughs> yes, thank you for volunteering. <laughs> yes, over on the right side. On the left side, excuse me, your faculty yeah, and participants. There's a there are plenty of c columns over here. Yeah. Are you? Yeah, you're, yeah, you're, no, you're, yeah. You're, right, right, right. You're on the right, correct side. Sorry. Harry, it's missing authors. Pardon? The, the list of authors. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> that, yeah. Uh, are they your <laughs> friends? <laughs> or your enemies? Exactly. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Does everyone have a sheet and filling it out? <laughs> Done it? Okay. Let's see. You want to go up and then fill out? There's some empty columns there. We have several empty columns. We need some volunteers. Volunteer? <laughs> You'll volunteer. Yes, just there's an empty column there. No, there's no grade given. All right, everyone can be a winner. Right, no grades. All right, you want to go up? There's still some columns that are empty. All right, let's fill in as many columns as we can. Thank you. Oh, you can go uh, fill out one of the columns, please. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Yes, you have a column there. All right. You done it? Yeah, no, there is uh, not enough space. Okay, all right, good. So, let's see. Okay. Okay. So let's look here. and see if some pattern emerges. There is no right order and wrong order. But it's interesting to think about when we write a paper, the order in which people read the paper. OK. Thank you very much, all. So we see if we look at the first thing that people read is, in most cases, the abstract. Oops, not everyone. Here's people who look at the figures. You look at the figures first. All right. Now let's see what's next. Does everyone read the, ab the introduction? That's B. Well, if we go across here, here's someone who reads the introduction. Remember, you wrote that paper, and you worked days, weeks on that introduction. 
because that would really set the stage for people understanding what you've written. But look, most people skip it, <laughs> right? Here's someone who reads the introduction, but there are a lot of people, look at this. There seems to be a predominance of H's, right? Those are figures. And if you look over the board here, does somebody have a cell phone camera or something? I'd like to have a record of this before it gets erased. But uh, I see lots of H's in the top part here. So people go straight to the figures. They read the title, they read the abstract, and they jump to the figures. Now let's see what is after H. And there's a letter G's too in the second row. Well, G's, 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 what is G? Mm -hmm. Conclusions. I would be one of the G's after looking at the figures. I would go to G. Some people go directly from the abstract to the conclusions. And many who, after they've looked at the figures, then go to the G's. You see, the G's, G's would normally be low in the order of the material in the text, but you see G's are predominantly high on the list. People jump to the conclusions to see what the authors conclude is important in the work that they've written. And you go on down, and I see some people get to, uh, what is I uh, references, and then forget about the rest. <laughs> okay. Some sections are unnecessary. You spent that time writing. There, there are people, maybe some of your friends, not anyone in this room, who would put really references up on the first line to see if their name is on the list, right? <laughs> OK. No one admitted that here. Well, but I mean, it's, very, it's very important. It's important. It is. If someone doesn't find me, it's irrelevant. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's clear their lack of understanding of what's important in the field. Yeah, they've demonstrated it. There's no need to read that paper. <laughs> OK. So. The point is that when we write a paper, we think of people reading it in a serial manner, but that is not the way it's read. People jump around, and therefore, when we write a paper, we should think in every section we write about making it as self-contained as we can, explaining terms or giving reference to a table that has definitions but if we just use a lot of terms in, say, the conclusions that we've used throughout the paper, well, if they've gotten to the conclusions, you might think the readers would understand exactly what you're talking about. But no, they haven't read anything else in the paper. They've just jumped to the conclusion section, and you have all this terminology which they don't understand. And so what would they do next? They would put that paper aside and go to another one, right? They have a whole long list of papers that have come up in response to their search for key words. So why read a paper they can't understand clearly uh, by just looking at the conclusions, what's concluded here, and, and so forth? So did someone get a picture, photograph? Yeah, but yeah for references. All right. So. What we learned, what I learned from doing this and asking people was that no matter how much care you take in writing this beautiful manuscript that is written to be read line by line from the first word in that beautiful opening sentence all the way to the concluding sentence won't make sense to a lot of the readers because They've jumped from the first line, or maybe from the abstract, all the way to the conclusion. OK. So let's talk about the abstract for a moment. Think about some of the things we might, might want to include in the abstract. We'll be writing abstracts today, next few days. We'll have abstracts on the posters. You write abstracts for papers all the time. Abstracts are short. If it's uh, 
some journals there's a few sentences, three or four sentences. Other journals, more specialty journals, are more often the abstract is longer, maybe eight or 12 sentences. Still, it's important to state what is the problem you're addressing. And then very briefly, maybe even in the first, same first sentence, why is it interesting? Uh, many problems in science which aren't very interesting. Why is your problem interesting? And then you've done something. What did you do? Did you do calculations? Did you do some experiment with a new technique? Did you do uh, some simulations? What was your approach? And most importantly, there in the abstract, you say, what have you learned that is new? What, is, what have you found? And given that you've stated what you have found, why is that interesting? Why is it remarkable? And how does it fit within the framework of past work? And what are the ramifications for the future? What are the implications? What further work needs to be done? Or, or what prior work that was done with certain ideas in mind turn out based on your work, not to be correct, what needs to be redone? What needs to be reconsidered? Now, uh, there's no need to make notes on this, because I have a handout which has all of this. Also, the same talk as every talk, including the one Mark Shattuck gave this morning, is online. You can download it from the ICTP website. If you don't have the the URL uh, will get it and distribute it to every, every lecture given last year at the hands-on school is online as a video, video together with the slides, the, see the individual. So, and, and then I have a little write-up in addition. Now we saw by consideration of the way people read papers that figures are very important. We are, as people in a culture in the world, storytellers. Every picture, every figure should tell a story. To some extent, a self-contained story. And it should be understood, it should be possible to understand it without referring a lot to the text. If it at all possible, you should have it so the figure together with the caption is a vignette, a short story of a larger story that the reader can understand without digging out definitions and without uh, going through the detailed text. Because most readers won't. They will look at one figure. They don't understand it. They won't go to the text in order to understand it in their first read through of the paper or perusal of the paper, they'll go to the next figure. And if they understand that, that's fine. But if they don't, they'll skip again to another figure. And at some point, they skip again to the next paper. They'll drop your paper and go on. So if the figures are not clear and relatively straightforward to understand, Maybe they have to put in some effort, but something that where the information that is critical is contained in the figure and in the caption. So the ideal figure is one that doesn't require you to even read the caption, much less the text. Sometimes you can have figures that are self-explanatory and interesting in themselves. For example, okay, do you need a caption? <laughs> do, you, do you need a 10-page paper to describe the situation? <coughs> okay. All right. Now, there's a, there are a lot of people who have written 
guidelines for making figures. But one that I particularly like is a book by Edward Tufte entitled The Visual Display of Quantitative Information. And Professor Tufte, or Dr. Tufte, uh, also goes around the world giving lectures on how to make figures, how to display data. Uh, I regularly get web announcements for $300. I can go hear him lecture or something. But the information, by and large, is in his book. And the book is pretty widely available. But it can be summarized very briefly, not the whole story, but that when you make a figure, you want the figure to show results, data, not a lot of labels and great detail, not a lot of numbers on the ordinate and abscissa, but emphasize the data. So you look at the figure, and the result of the data pops out. And that's what catches your eye. So you can make a graph with 10 curves, one solid curve, one dash, one blue, one red, one with green triangles, and so forth. And you make labels to explain all these differences. But it, it quickly becomes a quagmire, and you move on. Right? You want to make your point as simply as possible without a lot of curves. And as far as a legend is concerned, that little box over in the top right of the graph that has explanation of the 12 different symbols that are used, that's the kind of figure that people skip to the next one. Because you're trying to figure out which points go on which curve, and it at some point becomes uh, tedious and you just move on. So now here's a graph by a very famous science chemist, Linus Pauling, Nobel laureate. And just everyone is familiar with Linus Pauling's work. And this was a graph he had in 1947. Now I want you to think about how, given what was said by Tufte, guidelines of Tufte, how can this graph be improved. So pair up with your neighbor and talk about, I think there are probably 10 ways that this graph can be improved. Same information, same data points, no new data point, but make this graph communicate better to the reader, more eloquently, more succinctly. So they look at the graph and some information about the science pops out, OK? Talk, it would take two or three minutes. Talk to your neighbor. List how many things would you change in this graph. And everyone should be able to list at least six things to improve this graph. If you're not sitting next to someone, move next to them. Hmm? Want to go sit next to someone there? Yeah. Make a list. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, make your list of things that you would change.
Okay, so let's get some suggestions of things that Nobel laureate Lannis Pauling overlooked. He should have known better, <laughs> but you do know better, right? What could, yes, sir? First, we should remove the plus signs, which are like the grid lines, grid points. Right yes, the plus signs add nothing. And that's a response also to the admonition of Edward Tuff. Maximize the ratio of data ink to other ink. That other ink in those plus signs adds no information, right? Yeah. OK. That would be a first step. Very good. Someone else? Yes, sir. Use colors. Well, in 1947, that wasn't so. Uh, but what would you color? What would you color? Pardon? I mean, you can make it look prettier in the artistic sense, but in what way would, could you use color to add information for the reader, to make it more accessible, make the figure more accessible to the reader? Yes. Say it again. Instead of dash lines, use smooth curves? Yes. I don't know why they're dash lines. Why not use smooth curves? OK. That's reasonable. Dot and. But contrast between dot and dash. OK, yeah, you have the dots are the data points. That's the one thing we do not want to remove. <laughs> yes, sir? Uh, I see some discontinuity in the line, but uh, I cannot understand. There is some different set of data points, for example, between 0 and 10, and 10 and 20, and 20 and 30, 20 and 40. Uh, I cannot understand. There are some different, uh, different set of data points, but there is discontinuity in the yeah. graph. OK. I, I don't have an answer. Why Why does this dash line not go on up? It goes up here, but not on the left side. I, I don't know. And, and this, Pardon? Oh. Do you see? Do you see any relationship between the numbers identifying the peaks. Maybe you could put the numbers down next to the peak corresponding to the value of the atomic number at that peak. Or, or, if, it, or if it's really doubled up, you can just label the peaks as the, the doubled up result. Um, it, it really corresponds to the doubled up. Maybe you could put the particular element corresponding to the peak. Good idea. Good idea. Yes? Uh, we were talking about the, uh, we, we take down uh, the number of um, access X. points. Yeah. So instead of having 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, you can have just like four or five uh, reference values and, and larger fonts on the X as well. Right. Lar you could have larger font. And you certainly could get rid of, say, all these odd ones, 10, 30, 50, 70, 90. Or you could even maybe 0, 50, and 100. Or, but certainly fewer numbers on the axis. And, and that's, that's double what you're going to label the peak. And, and the same on the ordinate, right? Uh, there's a, yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, why, why didn't he put units? That's a. Good point. You teach your students to put units, right? What's the volume? Here, this is a volume. What's the unit of that volume? I don't know what the unit is. I thought it, I thought it might be cubic bore radii, but it didn't work out. So I don't know what the units are. Does anyone have an idea what the units might be? You should, should have put units. 
right? And as we said upon the horizontal axis, it could have fewer numbers, 0, 20, 40, 60, for example. And I would certainly, since it's to be read in an article, I would put the numbers horizontal. So the reader is not doing like that to read the number. Yeah, it's pretty simple, but, but just as a matter of practice. Anything else? Yes, sir. Good. I, if you're reading in a journal or on a web page, most of the time now we read on the monitor or a laptop or something, why not make this horizontal, put it up higher, uh, atomic volume. Agreed. Make others. Yes, sir. Um, yes, there's no, uh, like this extension here. What is that, what does that mean, that dash line there? I don't know. And this dash line goes up here, right? Okay. So, those are very good suggestions. And here is what Tufty did to improve it. And, and we made some further suggestions that I think are good, which Tufty didn't pick up on, but, uh, as was suggested, label the element that is the peak, and you immediately recognize that these are the alkali metals, right, that are the peaks. And you have this se section right here, which is different, the rare earths. And notice that he's gotten rid of the odd 30, 50, 70 here. He didn't put in, he didn't know what the units were either. I mean, <laughs> a graph in unknown units. Sometimes put, people put arbitrary units, which is okay. Anything else we notice from this? It's so much cleaner. Yes, sir. He ignores the origin. He ignores the origin, and he makes a point of that. You don't need the origin. Well, I happen to disagree. <laughs> I like to see where the zero is, because sometimes people offset the origin from zero. And, but Tufty says you don't need that. Another thing uh, that he emphasizes is you don't need the, oops, you don't need the side and the top. See this bar across? That's extra ink that doesn't add anything to the understanding of the data. I tend to put it aside in the top, but, but it's, it's a reasonable point. It's more ink that is not contributing to the data. Okay. So this is a graph you can look at and immediately interpret. You, you learn something by seeing this graph. Okay. Now, Tufty has an example of a graph which is not as good. Oh, okay. Yes, he's rotated like a. Normally we don't do it in our because of the space confines. Yes, but I still like the horizontal. I mean, this is often written, the axis label is often written vertically, particularly if it's long and you have units after that, then, then it's necessary because you, you don't have the space out to the left. But uh, you can frequently write it horizontally like this. Anything, any other comments about this graph? Ways to improve it? All right, so let's go to the next graph and see what you learn from looking at this next graph. See if you can figure out what the author wanted to present here. Time is moving on, so we're not going to spend much time. This is clearly junk graph. 
All right? So let's get some suggestions of things that are wrong with this graph that you would. The, the labels, yes, yeah, are very tiny, and you have 28, 29. Tw what are these numbers representing? Yeah, uh, age structure of college enrollment. So these students uh, in the bottom port part are under age 34. Okay, and these are the years 72 through 76. Uh, what about the color? How much have you learned by the color? Nothing. It, it's gratuitous cover. It add color. It adds nothing, right? Now, do you see any similarity between the bottom and the top? They contain the same information. It's a reflection, right? <laughs> there is no information there. So uh, there's unnecessary three-dimensionality. Yeah, it's subtraction. Okay, you're right. <laughs> well, and we've got this, this, this three-dimensionality which adds nothing. And we have numbers like this 28 connected to the 29 with this curve. It curves, and then there's a flat line, and then there's a curve and a flat line. But that's not based on any evidence. That's an artist's rendition, making these flowing curves, right? Uh, the, the top certainly duplicates the information in the bottom. Uh, the fonts are too small, we said, and so forth. So let's, let's think of ways this data, these same data could be presented in a way more accessible quickly. And you could do it with a table. There are only five points, five, five coordinate pairs, right? Five pairs. So this is a percent of college students over age 35 uh, through some period, these five data points. That's it. So you really don't need a graph. <laughs> For, you could have a table, or you could have a graph if one wants to have a graph. OK. Now, this is a, a nice image I like with a figure that was made by Paul Umbenauer. Now, to make a graph, a nice graph takes time. And you draw it over and over and over. And the example I'm going to give here is this picture that was made uh, more than 20 years ago when Experiments, experimentalists use cameras with film, ectochrome film. And Paul Umbenauer, who took this picture, set up on a Monday morning to make this picture. And he spent the whole day Monday moving the lights around to take picture of this oscillating structure. I showed the movie that Mark Shattuck made. This oscillates up and down. This is a snapshot in time. And and you can see these bronze balls here flying in the air, but a basic structure. And the lighting wasn't quite right the first day. In th those days, we took photographs during the day, all day, and the camera shop closed at 5 p.m. If you got the roll of 36 exposure ectochrome film into the camera shop by 6 p.m., they would have it developed by 8 a.m. the next morning. So it goes by the camera shop the next day. And the Pictures weren't so good. He did that five days. He spent a whole week obtaining that figure. Uh, but it's a nice figure, and it ended up on the cover of Nature, and in the New York Times, and in Scientific American, American Physical Society calendar, in various places. You, you make a nice figure. I mean, this is an image, but also a nice graph. It will be reprinted by other people who find the information useful and illustrative. So at this, we, we can talk about the graph itself. But it's simply labeled. Uh, and there's a more recent graph. It's not exactly following the guidelines of Tufty, but my 
colleague, Michael Martyr, made this and won some award for it because fracking, hydraulic fracturing, uh, is widely used in Texas. And they want to know after the first uh, yield, the first few months or first year, how much gas is going to come from this well. Can they predict? And in this analysis they did, the martyr and his uh, student did there, and colleague, he was able to take the data from 6,000 wells from this uh, particular uh, shale, and he did it for other shales. He has 100,000 data points or so from different Barnett shale, the different uh, shales that are being uh, uh, explored these days. And he found that within a, a short period of time, he could predict with reasonable, with some uncertainty, but with appropriate scaling, and the key was the scaling, the long-term total yields of gas. And that's used all over the petroleum industry now. So, it, okay. Now to writing. We're talking about papers where you do have to have writing in them. But figures are very important, and figures uh, are easier to interpret than writing. The I was developed after the, the great, uh, the great uh, dinosaur. Uh, disappearance with the in 65 billion years ago, then various species developed eyes. About 25 species, including uh, our ancestors, developed eyes that are similar to ours, similar in structure. So it's it's a very efficient kind of light detector, image detector. So 65 million years ago, that's millions of generations that the brain has had to interpret images. So we're very skilled in interpreting images. That's why one reason why figures are so important. We're much less skilled at interpreting symbols and making meaning of a set of symbols, that is writing, which was developed relatively recently, 5,000 years ago. No, just um, a short time in history by the Egyptians and Sumerians. And even after it was developed, most people were not able to read. Even in 1850, just five generations or so ago, only 10% of the world could read. Most of us in this room, including myself, had ancestors at that time who were not able to read. So the development of the brain in interpreting the symbols that are read when we read a journal article is much less than the development to recognize that there is a bear behind you about to attack you. You've got the peripheral vision. You can see that bear. Okay. But interpreting symbols is much more difficult, and that's why we look at figures. Most of us look at figures first. Because that, so only a few generations ago did people begin to read, write widely. OK, any paper, if it's scientific, must be reproducible. That means it must have the information. I'll skip through this quickly. But it must have all of the information that is necessary for another person to reproduce the results. Otherwise, it's not science. Right? If you do simulations and don't give the initial conditions on some nonlinear system like many of us study, then different initial conditions can lead you to different attractors, different behavior. If you have a theoretical analysis and you make certain assumptions and approximations, and Recently, we were reading a paper we could not understand. We read it for months. There was a change of variables that used the new variables used the same symbols as the older one. And one of my colleagues, Philip Morrison, 
after looking at the paper for the mul multiple times, realized there is a change of variables between that line and the equation that followed from that line in the next. That, and in, the author never stated that. I mean, you have to, the work must be reproducible. If you have uh, detailed sample preparation, you have to describe what was done. References are important. American Physical Society has made a statement about it, and I, I think I ascribe to this 100%. Omission of a pertinent author or reference is une unethical and unacceptable. We all have access to Google, and we can find the relevant articles. If a person has written on the same subject, but you don't like their work, or you've had a conflict with that person, that does not mean, that does not give you permission to omit them as a reference. Full referencing is the ethical and required. Oh, yeah, and you should reference other work. <laughs> Here's an example that I showed before. Uh, and we were surprised to see the cover of this magazine journal every month has a picture that looks rather similar. It's grayscale, not color, and it's been flipped over. See the two particles there? <coughs> but no one ever asked us for permission to use that. All right. So now I'll skip this. The only, I, I think. There's far too much emphasis on journal impact factor. Journal impact factor is based on the <coughs> citations in the first two years. But for most articles, typical article, 6% of the citations over the long term are in the first two years. The papers that we are, some of the papers our group have, has had, had only a few citations in the first two years, and there are a couple of papers that I had mentioned uh, yesterday in a talk, have thousands of citations, one of them 4,000, another 2,000 citations. But the citations didn't come until a decade later, or even later. It, you take Einstein's papers in 1905, that famous series of paper. There were very few citations to those for a long time. It took a while for people to appreciate something that was different from what they know. Now, if you publish a paper on cancer, a new, dis a new cure for cancer, you'll immediately, in Nature, and it's a cover article, it'll immediately get a huge number of citations. There's a large body of scientists working in the field, and it's of interest to many people, and be rapidly cited, and, and maybe not much later. It, but many times, work that is really innovated is not innovative, is not cited very much in the first few years. So there, that's just a couple reasons why I think impact factors have no significance. I'm not concerned about impact factors. So I'm through. The most important thing is to write and rewrite and rewrite. Ask others to critique your manuscript. Read a text aloud yourself, or read it to a friend, or get them to read it. When you read it aloud, you pick up errors in ink or ambiguous expressions, transitions from one paragraph to the next, which make no sense. And lastly, you should cut extraneous material. You spent six months working on an aspect of the experiment that didn't pan out, or it turned to be, out to be a blind alley. All that effort, you feel like you have to say it. No, you don't. Cut it out. Make the paper as succinct as you can. So writing the paper is not something, a good paper is not something that you do quickly. It takes time. It is really, I feel, an integral part of the research. 
in writing a paper, you find, or at least I find, that some of our arguments have holes in them. Some results we pr pr present are incomplete. You learn a lot from the writing process, and it takes time. It's important to start early writing, putting together the paper, thinking about the story. I come back to we are storytellers. A paper should be a story, should unfold like a novel unfolds, and at the end you have this beautiful result. Thank you.